bend our knees. O oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. O oh, Lord, we cast down our idols to give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble.
when I cannot stand, I lean on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Josh and Preston, thank you so much. Your music service not only praises the Lord and His glorious name, but also ministers to our hearts. So thank you so much. Uh, how do you like our spring decoration? All right. That's awesome. Monica, thank you. We really appreciate you coming here during the week, changing the decorations and making it look really nice. How many of you noticed something different about our church lobby? Did you see those two pictures? Kudos to Sydney Milam for finding them in Hobby Lobby and getting a 50% off, which I always go for saving church money, and Kevin Neeb for putting them up during the week as well. I believe uh, it makes a beautiful spiritual appeal of who we are as Willowbrook and also shows the values that we treasure here. Did you notice that in both pictures, Jesus is with whom? with children, and we do value our young people because quite often not they're just the future of the church, but they're the present of the church. Before I will uh, introduce you our speaker today, I know I need to make a special announcement in order to make the introduction right. You have noticed that for several Saturdays I have not been preaching, right? And I received nice messages and emails and text messages and Facebook messages, you know, whatever you could send. I really appreciate all that attention that you will check on me. Am I feeling all right? You know, I'm getting better. As you know, my health was struggling. So let me tell you what's going on. Since last year, somewhere in October, I had a series of doctor's appointments. And they carried from last year into this year. By my personality, you know that uh, I'm an active guy. I keep on moving forward, running forward, and quite often I have a tendency to disregard what doctor is telling me. So at this moment I know I need to do what is right in order to invest into my future. Because of the medical problems that I have, health problems, I know that I need to take a medical leave of absence. So for the next two months for sure, March and April, and possibly May, I will have a medical leave of absence from my pastoral duties. Very difficult for me to do. I have no idea how I'm going to survive. I think I'll be bouncing off the walls at home, <laughs> and in my mind, I will be still thinking about Willowbrook and what should be done and what can't be done. So I solicit your prayers. Because even though I understand it's an important and right thing to do, by my personality and character, I have no idea how it's going to happen. Mm. So uh, this is what's happening with me. And you know what affects one member of the family affects the rest of the family, right? So as you pray, please pray not only for me, but also for the whole family. Now, in order for me to get better and really get the best of the medical leave of absence, my doctor told me that I need to abstain from my pastoral responsibilities. And I was explaining that it's difficult because pastors are not when they come to church. When I'm at home, I'm still a pastor. I'm thinking, I'm planning. 
And uh, after talking with my doctor and with the conference office, it seems like it will be very beneficial for me. Again, another hard thing to say and to do even more if I will limit my attendance in Willowbrook. I know I won't be able to help myself as I will come into Willowbrook and I will notice this thing and this thing and this thing and know that this should be done and this should be done. So you will see coming me and my family to the church uh, during the next several months, but we will be not coming here regularly because I know that in my mind I need to put all of the worry, all of the planning uh, aside and really concentrate on my health. You know, even if I would not be a pastor and let's say I would move to Hagerstown area because of some other reasons and I will be looking for a church to attend, I would pick Willowbrook all over again. And you know exactly why. We have an awesome church. The relationships, the friendship that we treasure with each other go a long way. So for me not to come specifically to Willowbrook as regularly as I wish would be the hardest one. So please pray for me that God will help me to do what is the best, you know, for my health right now and for the family. Amen. So with this in mind, when I learned about my medical leave of absence and what it's important to do, I knew that I did not want to lose any momentum of what God has been doing in our church. So I was asking the conference that I will not leave on a medical leave of absence until I know that they found an interim pastor who will substitute for me during the months when I'm trying to recover. I have prayed to God. I have waited for the conference to respond. And this is where Pastor David Berthium comes in. He will be an interim pastor during the next several months, you know, May, March and April, and possibly May, as I'm trying to recover. I do not know David personally well, but I've heard so many good things about him. When I came to Willowbrook in... Uh, March, remember? Three years ago, by the way, and right now is March. Ah, exactly three years later. I came to Willowbrook in March, and uh, he continued an interim pastorship in Park Church, where I came from here, because they still didn't find their permanent pastor. And I heard very good things about him, but he's very loving, very caring pastor, and his greatest strength is visitations. So I think he will call you up and he will schedule a visit with you. I'm sure that he will provide an outstanding ministry to you and your families. You have shown me and my family a lot of support, a lot of acceptance. You surrounded us with love and care. I could only ask if you would please do the same for Pastor David. I believe you will be tremendously blessed by his ministry. Pastor David, do you mind please coming up here? And as he will tell us a little bit about himself and will minister to us for the sermon, I would like to pray for you. Do you mind? That would be wonderful. Let me pray for you. Bow your heads with me, please, as well. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you with our open hearts and our open minds, and we know that ultimately you are the one who loved the church and cares for it so much Amen. more than we could ever. So I understand that somehow it's difficult for us to grasp mm. your will and how things happen in our lives, but we know that you're mm. ultimately in control. I pray for a special yes. blessing over Pastor David as you would use him to minister to mm. people and families who are very dear to my heart, mm. who are true yes. friends, yes. and I have so many good memories to treasure. At the same time, I ask you that Pastor David would receive this welcoming and support and acceptance mm as I receive here in this wonderful church. Yes. Please, Lord, also I ask about myself and my family. Help mm -hmm. me to recover, gain yes. better, and to continue to do ministry for you and for your people. Lord, we yes. surrender everything and who we are Amen. into your hands, and we know that you will do so much more yes. than we could ever imagine. Yes. Amen. Amen. Brother Velati, I want to encourage you, nevertheless. It is difficult. And you're going to have to claim something like when Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, we're not talking about Jesus this time. We're talking about your doctor. <laughs> if you want to be restored to your health, we're all going to be praying for you to get through this tough time. I just went through it as I had to retire because I had a heart uh, surgery 
almost 10 years ago now. And there's no doubt about it, it will be challenging. But you see, I am still standing. I can still seem to talk and communicate. And so there is hope that you will be restored. In fact, you have the promises of God on that one there. And if you've read the sermon title, I was anticipating this moment. The fact is, God is still in control. And I am so grateful for that. And our prayers will be with you. And we will try our best to help you fulfill that promise, however that is. You folks know him much better than me, but... I heard such wonderful things when I followed him. And here I am following him again. It looks like the Lord says you, you need a good role model. Don't give in to the color of your hair. Just follow the leading of the Lord. And before I get into the sermon a little bit more, I, I've asked uh, Joshua and his team after I'm done with what I'm going to do for the moment because my wife could not be here. You're probably wondering, where is his better half? Well, she's had, I think the devil tries to get to me by putting her down in sickness. She's had discs out of her back, out of her neck. She's had knee surgeries. She's had ablations and all that can be done in the name of medicine. And they still cannot stop the pain so the doctor, the last doctor we saw said, well, we've got something, it's an infusion, where it's like dialysis, they put stuff in you. She's had two treatments, and last Friday was so terrible, she had enough pain that Tuesday night, I was praying, Lord, this, this is not the time, you've got to help us through this here, and I watched her wondering what the morning would bring. So I know the devil knows what you folks are doing. Your pastor has done such an incredible job. He's let the Holy Spirit woo him and work with you. And the only way sometimes we pass can be stopped is through our wives. But she passed through it. We went to two different hospitals and we finally got her going on her feet. I'm going to give you a picture of her. And it also shows me how long it has been since we have taken, you know, you get so busy sometimes, it's all children and grandchildren after a while. But you can tell by my color here, this wasn't last week. It was a, the last before I retired. But... She, God gave me a gym and he gave me my wife and she would have been here if possible and so my other son who lives downstairs from us well I'll give you some family pictures here this is the wedding of our daughter about four years ago well she is obviously on the right and her husband next to her and between the two of them is our youngest son John and He's with my wife right now so that I don't have a nervous breakdown and I'm able to concentrate on sharing with you. Our son David goes to Williamsport Church and that's his wife. And of course that's not all. This is why we retired to Michigan and a year later we moved down to Martinsburg because our son was at the review. And so that's the reason why Grandparents do almost anything. And this picture, when I saw this, that's our little granddaughter, unplanned, just looked, and there she was. A picture was snapped, and every time I look at that, I see the hand of God. It just inspires me. What will we do without love? It's all about love, folks. And because of love, God will get us through this, and he will even use this. The devil goes too far, does he not? He goes so far sometimes that God gets twice the glory because he's got an answer. All things work together for good. 
Well, let's see if I've got the right picture here. Yes, he's the God in control. And this is the part where I wanted to just kind of break announcement type things. And this may be quite a shock to some of you, what you just heard from your pastor. But the good news is it may get a little worse before it gets better, but just think of what's coming, folks. I wanted to sing that song again. I asked Josh if he would, just that, that one page, the first page, well, they don't need, what you can remember, Lord, give me clean hands and a pure heart, and what was the last part of it? And, yeah, and let's not lift up a voice to one another. We're going to just sing that one thing, and then we're going to have a little prayer just to mock the end of announcements and the beginning of God's special time. And give us clean hands and give, give us pure, pure hearts. hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Let's sing it again. Give yeah. us clean hands and give, give us, us pure hearts. hearts. Let us not Let us bow our heads. Oh, Father, we are so grateful for your love. We're grateful that you've managed to find a way to work all things together for our good, for your honor, for your glory. Now at this moment, we give you permission to take these hearts, take these eyes, these ears, Take our minds and, oh, Lord, speak to us from heaven. And may this message be not from any human source, but from heaven itself. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. Music is something that does something special. It moves us to something that we can't do just by reading something abstract. We are referring to Romans 8.28. And probably most of you don't need to look it up. It's already here. For we, what is the next word? We know. There is no doubt in my mind. I know that God makes all things work together for what? For good to them that love God. And it's not just that he's saying, I only do it for the people that are already deciding for me. He's always working at it. But it is only when you realize that and accept his love that you can receive that blessing that we're not in this world at the mercy of the evil one. And so we serve our incredible loving God. It's all about him. It's all about his love. He loves us more than we could ever put into words. No one's smart enough. You know, a pastor wonders sometimes, what is it that I can say that might make a difference? Well, let me assure you, I'm not smart enough. None of us is smart enough. It's not about being smart. It's not about being strong we can be strong-willed, I guess, but even that doesn't cut the mustard. It's about letting God's love move us to action. Have you ever heard of two young people falling in love and they don't see each other? They don't talk to each other? They don't communicate? You'd have to come to another planet to observe anything like that, right? Love demands a response. I love that picture. I use it a lot. I want you to put yourself in that picture right now. There are times when we feel the need for that hug, don't we? And maybe we can't be there physically right now, but friends, in your mind, you can experience that comfort this very moment. 
We're not here just because we're a group of people who joined the club. We are here because we need the touch of God. We need the touch of the Holy Spirit. It's about Him. It's about His guidance and leading us through things. God loves us so much. This may look like a strange picture. If God had a refrigerator, have you heard that expression before? I thought it might be nice to put our picture on it. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. Our picture, my wife and I, and individually, God is crazy about us, folks. We are so privileged. God is so good. This is just a little object lesson there. God is so good. Isaiah 55. Now, I, I hate it when they give you a text, they give you all the words, and you never get a chance to open your Bible. So I'm opening my Bible. Oh, it looks like that's where I put my notes. Isaiah 55. We're going to be verse, reading verse 8 and 9. I'm not going to show you on the screen yet. I want to encourage you. There used to be a time where we were people known as a people of the book. And I, technology is wonderful, but let's not let it replace us. Nobody knows whether you're carrying a computer anymore or a Bible. And that's why it's still a wonderful thing to carry around and to be proud that you're identified. Oh, they're the people who leave every Saturday morning with a Bible. It says something. Verse 8. This is God speaking, not me. You'd be in trouble if it was from me. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Who again is speaking? God is speaking. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. I think this is so important. I'm going to do something that I don't normally do, but I want you to remember this as long as you live on this day. God says, and I want you to look up on purpose, my thoughts are higher we need to elevate what we expect to get from God when we've come to church for a blessing. We do not have to leave the same way we came. We are to have an experience far above anything. And this may seem silly to you to watch me here. And the sillier it may seem to me to you, the better you will remember it, folks. I am doing this to impress upon you that what God has for us is beyond anything because our minds are down here on earth. And God says, my thoughts, my ways are much higher than the pastor who's standing in front of you is trying to describe and enter into that. As the heavens are higher than do you know how high that is, folks? This is just a little humble illustration. But God has something far beyond anything we can imagine. And this is it for those of you who like to see it in print in front of you. That's verse 8 and then 9. And then we go to 1 Corinthians 2.9. Another wonderful, wonderful scripture. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. We may not always have time to turn every verse because we're already getting late, are late. But as it is written, lawyers like things in writing, don't they? God loves to put in writing his promises to you and to me. Eye hasn't seen, ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man 
the things which God has prepared for them that love him. What an incredible promise. I'll tell you, it may be true, I haven't seen, I haven't heard, but I'll tell you, I come to that next phrase. I'll put it up there for you. Neither hath entered into the heart of me. I have a pretty good imagination, folks. And I think I can imagine some pretty incredible things. But God tells me I haven't even begun to think to portray what he has waiting for us. What an incredible God we serve. Always trying to bless us, to bring good out of what our enemies are always throwing at us. This is not a painting it is a real NASA picture. It's called Heaven's Gate. Can you understand why even scientists who don't believe in what we come here for have called it Heaven's Gate? What we have begun to see through the telescope is so awesome. Young people, this sermon, I hope, is something you can follow. There is nothing nicer than understanding what God is saying to us and being able to comprehend it. You don't have to wait to ask your parents afterwards. You can listen. Think of that picture. Heaven is a real place. I don't know if this could possibly be in connection with heaven's actual gate. I'll just tell you, this is where the story begins. It's not just good things, however. We have an enemy. That enemy is the very opposite of God. God gives and gives and gives. The devil wants to take and take and take. He wants to destroy anything good, anything decent, because he's got a problem with God. He's jealous, would you believe? Instead of being grateful for what he had, he turned on God. What an incredible sadness happened in heaven. We want to read about it in Revelation 12, 7 to 9. We'll read this one right off here. There was war where? In heaven. I can't imagine how it could have started in heaven. It is the great mystery of iniquity. Michael, another name for Jesus, and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. We are in a great controversy between good and evil. And in case we missed it, he's called the great dragon who was cast out, that old serpent. You recognize the word serpent, where it first shows up in the Bible? And in case we miss it again, the devil and Satan, has it been made clear by God who our enemy is? We don't have to guess. He's not just an ethereal force or power. And he was cast out into the earth. Well, to be sure... It wasn't just the earth. He made his way around, and his angels were cast out with him. The good news is maybe God has thousands and thousands and thousands of angels. That's three, right? The devil got just one third, thousands. But God's power is so much more than what the devil has done. Here you see some Pictures, depictions of what the great controversy is like. You know, we hear a lot, Star Wars and Star Trek and the Stargate. That's nothing new, friends. Young people, God is in the real Star Wars. And just like we call our sports stars, right? Ball players are stars. Football players are stars. God's heroes are his angels. They are the stars. 
They are the ones who are involved in this battle between good and evil. Ephesians 6.12 tells us, We wrestle not against flesh and blood. There's nothing we can win over. Young people, if you want to be on the winning side, there's only one choice here. The earlier we make it, the better. We don't wrestle against anything you can fight with, with weapons. We're fighting against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's no match for anyone. That's why I love that other song you sang, Joshua and Preston, I need thee, oh, I need thee. The sooner you make your decision to say, Lord, I know how much I need you, the sooner you have his help. He went through the universe, and unfortunately, we're the only ones who fell for his lies, his tricks. He was the most beautiful angel in heaven, but he let that jealousy, I want to be like God. Now, there's a good way to want to be like God, right? We want to be loving like him, compassionate, kind, but he just wanted the power. Power without love is worthless, isn't it? And so he tried force, and force does not work. It never did, it never will, and God will never use it. And that's why sometimes in our excitement we get overexcited, and sometimes we can drive people away from the very place they need to be at. I'm so glad for the emphasis your pastor has had on your church to be welcoming to new people. At any rate, Lucifer made the decision that he wanted to be God, he wanted to be able to create, and we can't do that. And so these pictures just illustrate the real Star Wars that's going on, and this may not even be an exact picture of a planet, but do you get the point? He is so angry, and there's only one way he can hurt God. He can't hurt him physically, can he? He's not stronger than God. There's really only one thing that would hurt God more than anything, and that's hurting who? Us. His children, the ones who Jesus died for, Once again, the devil goes too far, and even in his hatred, he shows how much God loves us. The more he hates us, we realize God loves us even more than that. It's incredible, the plan of salvation. Thank goodness that that picture doesn't go on forever. I want to share the story of a newborn. Well, this baby's not even born. It's a little baby that's still in the belly of the mother. It's an incredible story. A mother who tells her husband, we're going to have a baby, but the husband has been under the influence of liquor and is drunk most all the time, and he doesn't want anything to do with this baby. And so he tells her, I don't want the baby. He's not mine. You can say some awfully stupid things when you're under the influence of liquor. That mother was so hurt because she was so excited. And they just, the argument got worse and worse. And finally she says, all right, if you don't want the baby, I'm not going to carry it. And she made up her mind that she was going to get rid of that baby. Now I want to ask another question. How much power does a baby have? None. You are at the mercy of whoever has the power to do such things. All I can tell you is this was a very special baby. 
And God did not want this baby destroyed. But the evil one is always out to do the worst of everything. And it's a battle. It was not easy. She decided to go down to her doctor. This is where they lived in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. The top story. Let's see. I think I have a pointer right up there is where they lived. That's where this story happened. This is not make-believe, it's not borrowed. This is a real story. That baby was in real trouble because there was something about that baby that just could not be squelched. God would not allow it, but how do you stop something like this? She went down the stairs. At one socket is full of hills got the medicine, as a matter of fact, here's something that looks like it. By the way, can you guess who that baby was? It was me. I'm sharing that with you so you don't get too over anxious over stories. You know I must have made it through, but listen to what God did because he knew what was in my heart even before I was born, folks. He knew that I wanted to serve him with every ounce of strength and energy that I have. I've been praying for the, I haven't really had church responsibility. It's hard to sit there. I My heart goes out to you, Pastor Velody. It's difficult to sit there and not want to just take over and get up and share what the Lord has done for you. But that baby that me could not even pray, I was still being developed. What defense did I have? That's where the incredible love of God comes in, folks. God is still in charge. No matter how bad it looks, no matter how discouraging the circumstances, he has a way out if we give him permission. And even though I could not give him permission at that time in my life, our God is also omniscient. He knows, you know, what's the one that I'm looking for? Knowing the future. (laughs) Omniscient. He knew what was in my heart developing. He knew what was in my mind that was coming to fruition if he would give me some time. My mother went to the drugstore and she got it. That's all she had to do was to drink that and Everything else would be taken care of, and that would be the end of the baby. So she's coming up the hill now. She's been to the drugstore at the bottom of our hill. She's walked up to Washington Street, and out of this door comes the lady. It's a French neighborhood. One socket is very French, at least it was back then. Madame Bradeur. My number there comes out. She sees my mother walking. She says, oh, Madame Bétion, qu'est-ce que tu fais? What are you doing? How are you? Oh, you know my drunk husband. He's at it again. He says, and we've really had it out this time. He doesn't want this baby I'm carrying. And I'm not going to carry a baby that nobody wants. Well, I'm not sure about all the words and the theology. All I can tell you is that's something of what happened. And Madame Bradeur says, oh, Madame Bertram, she was a wonderful Catholic lady. You know what our Catholic friends believe in when it comes to that. Praise God, there is a group of people who are known for their stand against taking life. What a wonderful thing. If only we could take all the good things from every church and put them all together. Well, I think that may be why we're members of this church, however. 
praise God for the wonderful truth that he has given to us. My mother, but I dare says to my mother, oh, you can't do, don't you usually pray before you make big decisions? You see, our witnessing will come back to bless us folks. At that particular time, my mother was discouraged and she kind of let her faith go a little bit. And the lady she was witnessing to, Madame Bradère, remembered, we share with people, folks, but it doesn't go unnoticed. You may think they've forgotten all about whatever you, if you have shared in love, if you have shared even wondering if you use the right words, God knows what to do with our witness. It's not up to us after we have done what only we can. She tells my mother, don't you usually pray before you make big decisions? And don't you usually read your Bible about it? And my mother said, oh, we, we. So together, they both went up the stairs and inside and up to the top floor and I think my microphone is coming loose. Let's see if we can stay on it for a little longer here. And they went up and had prayer. And after the prayer, my mother took the Bible. Well, actually, I remember my mother doing this many times. She'd, oh, I'm always you. <laughs> And after her prayer, she'd ask God a question. Now, that's not always something that's a great thing to do because the devil can get in there and make things happen differently. However, God takes us where we're at, and that's all my mother had at the time. There were no pastors around one socket. She said, oh, Mojo, Palyama, talk to me, speak to me. What about this baby? Should I go through with this? Madame Bradard is here, and she's saying, I need to ask you, and so I'm asking you. And she opened up her Bible, and I have to go turn to it because, it, as you can tell, it didn't open to it for me today, just now, but it opened for my mother. And let me give you another slide here. Jeremiah, chapter 1, and verse 5. I'm reading this one out of my Bible again. This was God's answer to my mother about me, that baby. He says, Regina, <laughs> well, he didn't name, but you do know every Bible promise you can put your name in there, don't you? That is the way God works. Every promise in the book is mine, or line. Anyway, Regina, before I formed, well, it says thee, but he's talking about me. Before I formed this little boy in the belly, I knew. Is that possible for us as humans to know ahead of time, and especially under these conditions? But with God, nothing is impossible. With God, he's already ahead of us. He had already figured out how he was going to turn this terrible thing into a blessing. Before this baby was born, I knew that baby. And before that baby came forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Sanctified me. And one more thing. And I awe ordained thee. Friends, I remember when they interrogated me to become ordained one time, and they're asking me all these questions, and all I could think of is, oh, I was ordained a long time ago. You see, men only get in the way sometimes, but God is in the process of saving, reconciling, bringing good out of terrible things. I'm going to put it on the next slide so you can see it up here too. Before I formed in the belly, I knew thee. 
Number one, he knows me inside out. So he knew what I was thinking. He knew what was forming inside me. He knew my desire to follow him. You don't have to go over Fool's Hill, young people. God will help you through your whole life. I loved God from the moment I came into the world and came of age. I can't explain it. I don't know how he did it. I just know he did. And when I was five years old, I can remember sitting in church listening to the sermon saying, this man is talking to us about God, about heaven. I want to hear it. I want to understand it. I want to do it. Oh, young people, there's nothing more exciting than letting God be your forever friend. He'll take you all kinds of places that you could have never dreamt of before. I actually sat right about there about four years ago and said, well, a lot of nice people here. Lauren, how come I couldn't get myself involved in something like that here? At that time, I had no preaching assignments, no, it, it was almost like I was sent off to prison. And I sat there and said that, and I'm looking at that spot today. Can you believe it? God took this man who had had a heart attack, who had had bypass surgery. They took his heart out. They put the veins from my legs in, all over my heart here and there. They didn't think I would even make the surgery. And I not only, I mean, I, I had to retire, and I've been moving, moving. And I'm sitting there, and today is fulfillment of that thought of mine, that desire of mine in my heart. And young people, if you really want to dream, if you really want to let God do something incredible for you, just give him permission. He's been waiting for eons of time for you to make that decision. He's waiting. He's got it all set for you. All you have to do is say, oh, yes, Lord, use me. Bless me, lead me, and he will. It doesn't mean it's all going to be roses and all, but there is nothing in the world that is so nice as following God. I stand before you as a living proof of the God of the heavens, the creator of this great universe of all the galaxies, and he cares enough to live in my heart. It was my little heart when I was that little baby, and now that heart may be a little bigger. But they were in that building now. The story's not quite over yet. There's an interesting ending here. They're upstairs in that room. This is where we lived, the top corner of 14 Washington Street. We lived there till I was seven years old. And now Madame Boisselet, she's seeing the living God at work. Oh, friends, let God use you to share what he has done for you, what he has done for your friends, what he's done for your pastor, Velody, what he has done for the, this pastor who is so thrilled and privileged to be here. She said, Madame Petion, qu'est-ce que tu vas faire? What are you going to do now? And my mother says, Watch me. And she took the bottle out. And she crossed the street, like where the parking, where the cars are there. And she took the bottle. And let me show you what she threw it into. There were boulders over there. The bottle went smashed into a thousand pieces. And here I am. Do you think I regret anything in my life, folks? I only regret I don't have more time and energy. And I, I mean, I still feel the same as when I was a little kid. Well, there's more to this story. Oh, I put that in for you boys who want to know that God loves you like he loved me. It's not even my picture, but it's everyone who wants to be there. And some of you may be grown-up boys, and some of you may be grown-up girls. 
It's all the same, isn't it? We serve the same loving, guiding God, and he wants to use us in an incredible way. And so I put those in to remind you, claim that promise. And do you think we ever get so old that he can't do anything more? Well, I know I'm only 72, but I've gone to visit a lot of people in nursing homes at my age. All I can tell you is, if that fire that was lit in me, I think, when I was a baby, it's never gone out. And I don't plan on ever letting it go out. Jesus is giving us a gift beyond words, beyond description. Here I am at six years old. No, I think I was seven in the picture, but I'm going to tell you another story now. I've got time, but not much. <laughs> I'm already out. I was six years old when this happened, and I'm going to show you what I was doing. You recognize this? It's a curtain rod. And I have a vivid imagination. You heard me say that. Well, guess what I was doing outside the very house? I'm running down the hill playing. Do, 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 do. Jesus is come. You know that thing. Coming again. And I'm excited, so I'm not walking. I'm running. And I hate to tell you what. Oh, there it goes again. That's because my ear lobe is attached. And it's not like a lot of ears that these are made for. And that's why whenever they tell me i got to wear this, I know I'm going to have to struggle with it. But God is so good. He manages to get me through these things. I am playing lift up the trumpet, and I can't wait to be able to do that as I get older and I have more opportunities. Can you tell me, young people, what is stupid about doing that? Because it did happen. I tripped. And it's not a pretty picture. I hope you never have to experience what I experienced. Here I am, right on this street, oh, right about right about here on the sidewalk. Well, it was a sidewalk. Now they've got grass there. And it went right up through my pallet. And another inch, and it would have gone into my brain, and what would have happened to me? You see, young people, just because we give our hearts to God doesn't mean, oh, and when we're baptized, we were talking a little bit about that today. The devil doesn't leave us alone when we have made our decision. But the good news is God is still there to pick up the pieces. And the devil did not succeed then. My sister met me. I was going halfway up the stairs. I remember that day like it was today. The blood was coming out, and my sister almost fainted. But I, next thing I know, the taxi was outside. We didn't have a car because my father's always drinking, so he lost his license, lost the car. But that doesn't matter either. Our God says, doesn't bother me at all. I'll see to it that things happen. I went to the dock. However, there was something I paid a price for. It was foolish what I did. And after I was able to talk again, I talked like this, and you can call it, I just say it. Why? You understand the point? I could hardly speak so that people could understand me. And when I went to school at college, they told me, whatever you do, do not take any speaking classes because we can hardly understand you. You know what's interesting? Well, to begin with, you know what I wanted to do. So after they left, I signed up for theology anyway, because God had called me. Don't listen to people sometimes. God is the one, the only one who deserves our attention, our decision. So I signed up for theology, and I cannot explain it to you. It didn't happen overnight, but little by little, by the time I was done with college, 
And my first job was at the David Flagle School on Eastern Shore in Seaford. And by then, my voice was as clear, well, it is a little bit peculiar, right? You say, oh, where is your accent? A lot think I came from New England, or maybe I came from the South, because it's a little confusing. Because of my accident, uh, kids made fun of me all through school, and I, I got used to it. But friends, we serve an awesome God. And I've even had most of my older folks tell me, Pastor, we heard you loud and clear the first time and along. I don't think you have that problem with your pastor here, but there are some places where people talk and nobody can understand them. I praise God for that. It is another miracle. And we're to the end now. I ain't coming to the end. <laughs> makes me want to cry sometimes, believe it or not, because we're talking about eternity today. We're not talking about buy this product, buy that product, drive this car, buy this house. We're talking about making a decision instead of losing our eternal life, gaining eternal life, our names being written in the books of life. Oh, friends, there is nothing more special and wonderful than that. And the universe is looking on that you see up there, the stars and the planets out there. They watched me as I told my mother I had to go to school, and she would cry and say, you can't, I need you at home. And I said, Ma, how can I be a pastor if I don't go off to school? Then I would see my brother my brother was 20 years older than me because I was a real baby baby in, in our family. And he'd say, why are you throwing your money away like that? It's a waste of good money. Come work with me. He was in a nursing home business, and he was a millionaire. And he would tell me how crazy I was. Well, I'll tell you, folks. He who laughs last laughs best. <laughs> Now I'm going to show you something incredible. Do you know who's in the water of baptistry with me? That's my big brother. You're wasting your money. Why don't you get a job like everybody else? I don't want a job like everybody else. I want a job like Jesus had. I want to do what Jesus wants me to do. I want to visit people and help them to see what a wonderful thing it is to worship together and to let the Holy Spirit come into your heart. And this was the day, after all those crazy things that he said I was, going to, I was doing, you know what he's saying to me right now? He said, baby brother. He loved to call me baby brother. I'm so proud of you. Friends, in a million years, could you ever force that out of someone who's convinced that you're wasting everything that you've ever done and all your money? And by the way, when he said those words to me, he had lost all his money. It took that to get his attention. One more thing. You see this lady? She's my baby sister. Well, she's eight years older than me, but it's my baby sister. And she used to run around the table while my mother chased her because she'd been smoking and taking, uh, you, you probably can guess, she was not cooperating at all. And I always got in trouble because my mom would ask her, Jeanette, and then she'd say, David, is that true? Well, I wanted to tell my mother what she wanted to hear, but I couldn't. <laughs> now, this is... 1995, 1996, not that long ago, I got to baptize my baby sister, even though she's eight years older than me. Friends, God's power is so awesome, there is no way I ever want to turn my back on him. I want to spend every strength serving him, and we've come to the end, and we're back to our original picture and I want to sing it with you, the song. Oh, can we get the song? I guess we're going to have to leave this one. Do we have 198 on the... And can it be? Is it possible 
that God loves me so much, you can finally stand up and do something, folks. It's not just a closing song. It's an expression of everything that's welling up in your heart and in your mind, your opportunity to tell God, amen, I believe it, I want to do the same thing. Young people, I invite you to sing this song with us, hymn number 190, and can it be... Let's all stand. <clears throat> we'll be singing three verses, one, two, and four. like the organ wants to keep going. I want to join with you, but we better have a prayer. Oh, Father, there is nothing in this world that can begin to compare with your matchless love that compelled you. Nobody forced you. You didn't have to be talked into it, but you wanted to come down and save us because because you couldn't bear the thought of living without us. Oh, Lord, we can hardly comprehend that. Please draw close to us. 
Help us to begin to wrap our minds against such love. How can it be? So that we will gladly and with everything in us pursue you and say, Oh, Father, I give you my life. I give my life to Jesus. I give my life to the Holy Spirit and walk with me every day of my life. In his name I pray, amen.